Coming up on DTNS, Instagram is 10 years old and has brought back its old icon. Flippy the Burger Robot goes on sale, and Shayna Moon is here to tell us how story fits into game development. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 6, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the dark forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, Senior Project Manager at Unity Technologies. You might know her work as being a producer on God of War. Shayna Moon is here. Welcome, Shayna. Good to have you. Hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, it's so much fun. We were just talking about uh, a little bit about game design on Good Day Internet, talking about uh, the effect of D&D on, on story. Uh, uh, and we were talking about Roger editing hex codes for cheats in his games. That's all in Good Day Internet. You can get that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple announced an event for October 13th, 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time with the tagline, High Speed which likely points to 5G connectivity and an A14 processor for new iPhones. Besides new iPhones, reports indicate we might also hear about over-the-ear headphones, a new HomePod, tracking tags, and the first ARM-based Mac. Bloomberg notes that Apple stopped selling headphones and wireless speakers from Sonos, Bose, and Logitech in its online store sometime before the end of September. Employees at Apple's physical stores were also instructed to remove the products. Ah, so that would uh, bear out the HomePod and the headphone uh, rumors. Mm -hmm. Google has renamed its set of online productivity and collaboration tools from G Suite to Google Workspace. They even have new logos for all the apps and a few new features like collaborating on documents with guests in chat rooms, previewing linked files, expanded picture in picture for video calls and meet. And if you use the at symbol and mention somebody in a document, Workplace will now show you contact details and suggest actions like assigning them a task or something. Speaking of Google, Google Assistant now works on Toby Dynavox devices, which use gaze tracking rather than voice interaction for accessibility needed by users with disabilities like cerebral palsy, autism, and ALS. Users will need a Google account to add to Toby devices in the Google Home app as a smart speaker slash display. The tiles can be created for commands that would normally be spoken. For instance, you would uh, look at a title a tile for what's my calendar title today, and then here are your calendar items. Facebook announced it will support Netflix and Zoom on its portal devices. The company will also expand its selection of stories offered through the, its story time fe feature and add new AR effects and offer Spanish language voice control. Security firm Pentest Partners discovered a vulnerability in an internet connected chastity device called mm -hmm. the Cellmate. The Cellmate could lock or unlock by Bluetooth using an app. However, the API did not use a password, meaning anyone could take control of the chastity device locked on you and lock it without the ability for it to be unlocked without bolt cutters or an angle grinder. The makers of Cellmate have pushed out an updated API, but have not taken down or fixed the previous one, which is still in use. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Moving on, Dell announced the Ultra Sharp 32 HDR Premier Color Monitor, which it claims is the first monitor with 2,000 mini LED backlit dimming zones. It has a 99.8% DCI-P3 and 93% Adobe RGB color gamut coverage, as well as VESA certified HDR 1000 support. It comes factory calibrated with a built-in colorometer and supports for two, uh, supports two computers with picture-in-picture. -picture. The UltraSharp 32 HDR Premier Color Monitor sells for $5,000, including the stand arriving November 5th. 
Well, you get the stand for that price. Yeah. Uh, Reuters, <laughs> unlike some other manufacturers, Reuters reports the U.S. House Antitrust Subcommittee is expected to publish a report this week on Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Alphabet. The draft makes a vague call for break up tech for breaking up tech, com tech companies, makes it easier to block acquisitions, and recommends data portability and interoperability interoperability standards. The report does not address censorship of speech. And AT&T has stopped taking new orders for DSL service in the United States as it begins to phase out that service. Uh, that leaves some people without an option, though. A report from the Communication Workers of America and National Digital Inclusion Alliance notes that AT&T has deployed fiber to the home in 28 percent of households in its territory as of June 2019, and it slowed roll out down, so it hasn't added much since. AT&T does offer a fiber copper hybrid to about 72% of households in its territory. AT&T continues to fall behind cable ISPs with 15.2 million internet subscribers compared to Comcast 29.4 million and Charter's 28.1 million. All right, let's wish Instagram a happy birthday. Oh, let's. Instagram is 10 years old, y'all. <laughs> Want to feel old? Yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, Instagram is celebrating by giving its users old home screen icons along with some safety updates. To change your icon, if you so choose to do so, you go to the settings page in Instagram, scroll down to uh, set off an animation which uh, ends with a page that lets you change the icon to one of the company's first four style icons, as well as one called Twilight, which is a take on the current icon. So, you know, cute. Instagram also brought back Stories Map, which shows you a map and calendar of your stories over the last few years. You know, if, you, if you've been doing stories, that might be kind of helpful. In more practical features, Instagram now uses machine learning trained on previously reported comments to automatically hide potentially offensive comments that you can choose to view if you so desire. And Instagram also expanded its nudge feature to warn posters of potentially offensive comments from once to each attempt. Yeah, so uh, a better management of, of trolls in your Instagram comments feed. I think a lot of people will be pleased to see that. Uh, I was uh, one of those people who was taken by the idea of, oh, I could put the old brown camera icon back. And I immediately went and did that. I had forgot that they had done a more <laughs> Polaroid looking version of the camera. Uh, that one was in there. That was its launch icon. And I guess they changed it within the first month. Uh, you can also change to the beta version of the icon, which I never saw in reality. Uh, but I don't know. I, I For a 10 year anniversary, I thought this was kind of fun. It's kind of funny, but the new icon has been around for about four years. So it's not like, oh, I remember 10 years ago. It's just remember five years ago which is a little bit less impressive, <laughs> I feel. Um, maybe I'm being a little bit of a curmudgeon. I mean, there. I don't know. Instagram, 10 years ago. Really? 10 years. Yeah, it's kind of mind-blowing. Shana, I don't know. Do you even use Instagram? Is this affecting you at all? I do. I like Instagram. Actually, recently I got taken in by an Instagram ad. I won't say what the product is because they're oh, not paying. Oh, yeah. It happens. That, that's We've where they get there. you. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that I like for like personal photos, that sort of thing. It's definitely not my primary social media, though, but I know for a lot of people, it definitely still is. Where do you fall in this nostalgia, <laughs> for, <laughs> the nostalgia spectrum that we have oh, laid out here? I mean, my nostalgia is for like, certainly not a 10 year old web <laughs> app. I mean, I'm nostalgic <laughs> about, I don't know. AIM and live journal and stuff like that. Not right, right. Instagram. <laughs> That's real nostalgia. Yeah. 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 The, the, <laughs> the problem is it's too it's too current for 10 years to mean something. It's something mm. if it's, it's something that was big 10 years ago and that you don't have anymore. Uh, this doesn't yeah. I I, I think just, I just really didn't like the new icon and that's why I was so excited <laughs> to be able to switch it back. That makes sense. Uh, security researchers have combined two exploits that were initially developed for jailbreaking iPhones. Uh, you may have heard of them, the Checkmate and the Blackbird, uh, to hack Apple's 
T2 security chip. That's the one in your MacBook or your MacBook Pro. Uh, the T2 is a coprocessor that also serves as a secure enclave processor, or SEP, to process cryptographic operations. So keychain passwords, touch ID, encrypted storage, secure boot. You don't want people breaking into that. The, ex the exploit lets a user run code inside the T2 chip during boot up to alter its behavior uh, letting the user, if you're doing it to yourself or the attacker, if it's someone you don't want doing it, uh, gain access to your encrypted data and get control of the machine. Now, a hacker would need physical access to the Mac uh, to do this. You have to create a special USB-C cable, uh, attach it to the Mac, reboot the machine, and run the check rain jailbreak, which combines those two vulnerabilities, during boot up. Uh, the approach works because Apple left a debugging interface open, which allows device firmware update to run without authentication. That's why you're able to get in there uh, and do something to the T2 chip. Sadly, the vulnerability appears to be unpatchable, though it is detectable. So you can, you can undo it. Uh, you can take a couple of actions to undo it, but it's not something Apple can put out a firmware update. Now, before you run around with your hair on fire, uh, if you're not a journalist working with sensitive sources who are being oppressed or a diplomat or a head of state, you probably don't need to worry about this. Someone has to have physical access and they, ha and it's not a, it's not an unsophisticated exploit. It takes a little sophistication to be able to pu pull it off. Uh, but not, not a great look for Apple, no matter how you think about it. Yeah, it seems like it's it would need to be extremely targeted uh, as an attack. I'm also a little bit uh, heartened by the fact that it is de detectable and reversible, meaning someone who would really need to pay attention to something like that could soon, I'm guessing, have a tool, maybe even a tool from Apple, uh, to periodically periodically look for it and do something about it if it's found. Um, I don't know if Apple would do something like that, but certainly I'm, I'm guessing that uh, some white hat hacker would develop a small tool like that, that those who know they need it might uh, go and, and look for and use. It's a little bit like checking that the barn door is closed after the animals all get out, I suppose, uh, if somebody has got the data off the machine that you want. But yes, it is, it is better than the alternative, which is to never know uh, whether you've you've been attacked or not yeah. in this situation. I mean, you could you could theoretically, if you're in a really sensitive environment, you could have the thing and run it. I don't know how uh, resource intensive it is, but you could have it run every 30 seconds, you know, if it's if it's possible. Mm. I guess we don't know. What do we all think about talking about a robot for a minute? Oh, robots. Oh, yeah. it, it's a robot that does food does even better. Even better. Miso Robots has put an automatic food preparation robot on sale globally. It already existed, but now it's you know now it's open. Flippy, you may recall the name Flippy, reaches down from the ceiling to make burgers, fries, anything involving a fryer or a grill. It uses a camera array, including an Intel 3D sensor and thermal camera to identify foods and navigate its environment based on the machine learning algorithms. It can scrape off Crud, remove excess oil, cook 19 food items. It really does it all. It can also fry chicken tenders, chicken wings, popcorn shrimp, french fries, tater tots, potato wedges, hash browns, onion rings, and waffle fries. It moves on a rail overhead as a, and is controlled by a 15.6 inch touch screen. If you're wondering, all right, this sounds so great. How much is it going to cost? Well, the Flippy Robot on a Rail, aka Flippy Roar, sells for thirty thousand U.S. dollars. Although they can be rented for fifteen hundred dollars a month, including maintenance and upgrades. Part of a pilot program at White Castle locations and soon operational at fifty Kelly Burgers. Yeah, Roger, uh, our producer, went and, and looked at this when they first introduced it at the Cali Burger several years ago, uh, and it's it's made a lot of advances since then. It's not not something you're going to buy for your own kitchen at this point. At least most of us wouldn't. Uh, I even don't for think so. Yeah, yeah, no, not for that but price. Yeah, but uh, Roger, what do you, what do you think? Are you excited to see the next Flippy Roar? Um, you know, in this kind of uh, germ sensitive time, I think this would be a really cool product because ostensibly it would be 
uh, a little bit more sterile than having a human back there doing up your order of fries uh, and onion rings. Um, it is still limited to basically fried foods, which might blunt its uh, uh, reach in areas that are maybe a little more health conscious. Mm. Uh, but I, for one, welcome our new robotic fry cooks. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. I, I just kind of want to see it at work. Uh, yeah. I do, you know, whenever we get these robot stories, we always uh, have to consider, like, is it going to be used to replace employees? Or as most of the time companies say is they want to use this to let employees have more time for customer service, which if they did that would be great. I mean, this is awesome. Like, this is not unlike the, uh, it was the, uh, what was the? Um, <laughs> there was a robot that was coming down to the ceiling. I think I, I know, know which Patrick, one you're, you're talking about. You're laughing at me because I'm like, yeah, it's the one that like it was cleans to do everything assisted from living situations. Yeah, yeah the, the, the from, robots from, on rails above your head is kind of the new trend for sure. It kind of is right because it's like, well, you know, it's it's less of a footprint, right? So something like this, yeah, sure, we're talking about things that are fried. But it's the beginning of something that is potentially pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sure it could. It could be. I mean, currently it does this, but it could do a lot more, and maybe not only for cooking. Um, Thirty thousand dollars was a little bit disappointing to me because I was already imagining it coming to my home and and cooking stuff. Um, but I'm hopeful that you know, for a summer where there's a lot of barbecue happening. 1500 bucks, maybe you can rent it for a month, or maybe <laughs> I can invite all of you and, and have a yeah. uh, I really don't think that's the target of it, but sure, yeah, why not? Uh, I, I, I want to eat something created by Flippy Roar. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> Shana, Me would too. you eat something created by Flippy? Yeah, of course. I'm not like terrified of the robots <laughs> turning against me. I don't think the robot's going to poison me. Although now I've spoken that into existence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've heard yeah. you. That's where they get you. I, I had <laughs> literally never had a worry about this, but now it's all I can think about. So exactly. thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget you can subscribe to our shorter five minute show, Daily Tech Headlines at dailytechheadlines.com. A video game's experience is more than just the gameplay. It's also the narrative that glues all those various gameplay elements together. We asked Shayna on the show today to learn more about what developers need to think about when they're developing a game's story. Let's start uh, with lore, Shayna, the backstory of characters in the world. How important is lore? So lore is is super important uh, to, to any kind of game that's really gonna emphasize story but it's really one piece of the puzzle, right? So while you have maybe your narrative department, or if you're on a smaller team, just one writer working on the backstory of your game and your world, you also have engineers putting together the systems that are gonna run the game. You have designers thinking about what kind of mechanics are gonna be involved. You have artists working on, you know, what kind of style they wanna go for for the game. And, Generally, in, in a good functioning team, these people are all communicating with each other and, and everything kind of informs everything else. It, it kind of depends on what the priority is of the team. Um, there, there's a whole spectrum of games and you know there's games where you can say sort of written down big picture story lore is not as important. And then there's other games where that's really the foundation of the player's experience. So, yeah, so it sounds like, I mean, depending on the team that you have, do you start with the game mechanic? Do you build a story around that? Or do you kind of suss out the team and figure out, okay, here's what we can do, here's what we're good at, here's what we'll go from there? It's interesting because for, it, it can depend on the team. You know, some developers are more suited to making uh, a first person shooter. Some developers are great at doing puzzle style platformer games. It, it can depend a lot on the skill. And then I talked about the art team earlier. It can talk, they can have some sort of artistic um, point of view that they really want to explore and develop. Um, there was a game that came out a couple of years ago called Grease, which is a 2D animated platformer and and so much of that game revolves around the art style and kind of this 
experience of beauty in gameplay, but there's a narrative to it. The player goes on a journey, but you're not picking up documents and reading out, you know, the story of Thonar, the great king, blah, 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 but <laughs> you're still experiencing a story. It's just different. It's designed in terms of the gamer's experience. In, in every type of storytelling, whether it's books, movies, or video games, there, there are different types of stories you can tell. What are, what are the types of narrative, or, or I guess the, the ways you can tell the story, what are the types of narrative in video game storytelling? Typically, when we're talking about games that are narrative-focused, the big split is between um, basically like a linear narrative, so something that you would think about in terms of like a cinematic experience or a movie. A like great a Last of Us kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Last of Us is kind of um, well known for being very cinematic. It has right. beautifully rendered uh, cutscenes, absolutely gorgeous game. And and yeah, like your experience of that game is you're going from point A to point B, B having some combat, having some puzzle encounters. But at the end of the day, there is a story that that team is trying to tell. And then... There are other games that are more sort of open, um, you know, the term would be like open world. And um, that can vary in terms of like, you can have a more branching story where the player is making decisions that kind of change the outcome of what can happen in the game. So um, one game I'm actually started playing two weeks ago because it's just one of my favorites is uh, Dragon Age Origins. And Dragon Age Origins is cool because it does not just change based on decisions you make during the game, but you have the option of choosing six different origins for your character. Um, and that origin changes the game, uh, sometimes significantly over the course of, of play. It, it still has an ending. It still has a thing it's going for. There are other like even more open-ended things, but in terms of like RPGs, that's kind of what we talk about when we talk about like branching story and more open story. And then something that's like completely open where it's more about, you know, the narrative that the player discovers um, could be something as, as, you know, kind of well-known as like Minecraft, right? Like Minecraft presents you with all these different biomes and, and characters and enemies. And really there's not like a concrete narrative, but, you know, players will talk to each other and say like, oh, I went to this place and this thing happened. And, mm -hmm. and those are kind of like the player stories that can come out of, of those super, super open environments. Yeah, I wonder if it's uh, appropriate to call something like that, uh, like, a, I don't know, a systemic uh, story where the systems of the games or the environments will tell the story as you discover it, not literally tell it to you as they would in more classical media. Um, there are a lot of games like, I don't know, just off the top of my head, things like Dead Cells or uh, you talked about Greece, of course, which isn't quite a narrative experience, but you, the story is inferred by the environment. Is that like, it's often, I guess, a, a, a necessity of smaller budget games, but is that like a whole other type of storytelling in itself that is emerging? Or is it still like, I don't know, small individual projects that happen to resort to those users to tell their stories? So it's interesting because there's there's definitely a certain type of storytelling that is associated with bigger budget games, right? Like um, Sony puts out a lot of prestige titles that have very high budgets and they typically have sort of very cinematic storytelling. Um, you know, on the, on the Microsoft side, something like, like Halo has this sort of very epic linear storytelling and, um, 343 has been definitely like pushing the envelope in terms of the visual fidelity of their like narrative and cinematic content. Um, but there are also, there are smaller, um, sort of in the double A space funded games that also try to take that approach. Um, one recent example would be uh, there's a studio called Spiders and they made uh, a game called Tech Romancer. They also made a game called Greedfall, which are taking more of those cinematic storytelling approaches. So it's definitely not limited to the higher budget. I'd say, I'd say it, it's more challenging because players expect a certain level of visual fidelity these days, but um no, there there are there are ways of really telling any kind of story that you want to, regardless of of budget. And I don't think that one is inherently sort of married to to bigger, smaller budgets. 
when you think of the uh, storytelling, there, there's definitely uh, uh, an impact with video games of, of the hardware, of, of what you're using. How, how has newer gaming technology uh, impacted the storytelling, the narrative game design? The, the biggest impact uh, from my point of view has definitely been player expectations in terms of the amount of content. Mm -hmm. So if you're buying like a big AAA game and you're spending your $60 to, to buy your game, um, you have certain expectations about the amount of stuff that is going to be in that game. Um, there have been instances in the past where, you know, a Call of Duty game comes out and the single player campaign is fairly short um, and players get a bit upset. Um, so that, you know, the bigger, bigger hard drives get, the bigger downloads get, people are expecting more and more content. You see that a lot um, also in, in kind of online games where, you know, you may be paying a subscription, you may be paying mm -hmm. for cosmetics, but people have very high expectations. Sometimes I think a bit unfairly, because if you break down your $60 purchase, if you play that game for 40 hours, you've definitely gotten your money's worth, but I think some people sometimes have higher expectations even than that. I mean, Shana, having uh, kind of been entrenched in the, in the games biz for some time, what would you like to see? You know, what, okay. The, you know, the consoles are getting better. The, the, you know, we're, we're all getting, you know, 8k kind of stuff, but what do you want to see in games? So my aspiration for the games industry does not necessarily have a lot to do with getting to like the most highest fidelity cutting edge tech. The thing that I really care about is getting the tools that people need to make games um, into as many hands as possible. Because I think that when we put those game development tools in the hands of, you know, people from different cultures, people from marginalized groups of, of any sort, you get more interesting stuff, you get game developers introducing things into the, the conversation of games that, you know, the establishment might not necessarily have ever even thought of, you know, you have better representation, and, and it really just makes the whole landscape of, of people's experience with games better. Um, I really, I really love just how many like open source game development tools there are these days. Um, there's the Blender project and Blender has really like ever since like when I was in college, Blender was a thing and it's just continued to get more and more sophisticated. It's really democratizing tech for people. Unity, of course, is also an engine that's very accessible. I work for them. They didn't pay me to say that, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Like when I was in college, like we were really like, Hey, can we get unity on these computers? Cause like, this is a way we can make games. So yeah, yeah. yeah, getting, getting the tools into people's hands and really making opportunities for people who wouldn't normally, like I'm from the Midwest and I had a lot of advantages growing up and it was still really hard for me to get into the games industry. So I try to do what I can to, to help people break in, in, in that way. I th really thought you were going to say you wanted smaller hard drives. This is a much better answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two gigabyte hard drives. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, if uh, anything Shana has said resonated with you, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. That's where you can talk about all sorts of stuff. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Before we get out of here, it's time to check the mailbag. It is. Al Spalding wrote in about um, our our guest, Mark Johnson, yesterday, who uh, is the co-founder of Plane for Change. And Al says, this is so cool. It's an amazing project. I've seen and heard more musical instruments that I never had seen before in three songs that I knew existed. I've been going down the rabbit hole on the YouTube watching these for a while. Oh, thank you, Al. Appreciate that. I know. Very cool. Also, thanks to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Ken Hayes, Tony Glass, and Jeffrey Zilks. Also, big, big thanks to Shana Moon for being with us today. Shana, you, you're you obviously very busy, uh, and we'd <laughs> love to give people a chance to let you know what you're doing else and where they can find you. Yeah, so the easiest way to find me, well, there's there's shanamoon.com, which is where you can find all my very professional information. But then the easiest place to talk to me about game stuff is Twitter. I'm at uh, Twitter at Q-O-R-Q-U-I-Q. 
don't ask. It's just, it's just for fun, y'all. I'm just having a good time. So feel free. <laughs> I, I love to talk about this stuff. So you can, you can hit me up on there. Solidarity. My Twitter account is A C E D T E C T, and I have to spell it out too. So uh, we we will have a link in the show notes to Shana's Twitter account if you want to find it there. There's another way you can get it as well. Uh, thanks again, Shana. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja for being with us today. Patrick, what's been going on since we saw you last? Uh, well, if you uh, thought the conversation about gaming was interesting, you might enjoy Pixels, which is a show I do about uh, gaming news. And to find it, it's the opposite of Tom and Shana's uh, Twitter accounts. It's super simple. You just go, not Patrick, because my name is Patrick, so not Patrick, and you add .com, uh, and you find the links to all my shows. And it's also my Twitter handle, by the way, not Patrick. So both of those work. Hey, folks, if you want a mask or a hoodie or a mug uh, or a mouse pad, I got a DTNS mouse pad right here. In fact, I need a new one. This one's getting kind of dirty. So head on over to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Helps you out with some new stuff. Helps us out as well to keep the show going. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your feedback. Keep it coming. We're also live. Join us if you can, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Creator Week rolls on with VFX artist Carrie Smith tomorrow talking about what goes into all those computer-generated effects. Scott Johnson will be here as well. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>